Herzlich willkommen, ähm, liebes Publikum. Äh, herzlich willkommen zur 37. Edition des DocFests. Mein Name ist Julia Teichmann äh, und ich stelle Ihnen hier die Filme und Filmemacherinnen vor mit, äh, mit meinen Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Ähm, hier geht es um äh, einen Film, der läuft in der Reihe Doc Horizonte. Er feiert seine Deutschlandpremiere auf dem DocFest. Ähm, er heißt Batata und ist von Nura Kevorkian, eine syrisch-libanesische Filmemacherin. Ähm, der Victor Doc Horizonte ist dotiert mit 5000 Euro, gestiftet von der Petra Kelly Stiftung. Und ähm, außerdem ist der Film für den Publikumspreis nominiert. Sie können auch online für diesen Preis abstimmen, den Kino Kino Publikumspreis, gestiftet von BR und Dreisat. Welcome Nura Kevorkian. Um, good to have you here, at least online. Um, where are you, how are you and where are you at the moment? I was just saying that I'm, I'm based in Toronto right now. Um, and I would have loved to attend uh, Darkfest Munich, but Hot Dogs Festival is happening at the same time, so I'm sorry that I missed it, but this is very exciting for me. Um, would you tell me maybe, because in the beginning you started filming um, Maria and her, her uh, big family um, in 2009, when you started um, filming her, was this already um, meant to be like a long-term observation? Was it meant to be like for these 10 years or what film did you have in mind when you were starting to film? Well, I started, I mean, for a very long period of time, I always wanted to make a film about the Lebanese and the Syrian people and this tension that they have, this dislike that they have for each other. You know, I grew up in Lebanon, my father is Lebanese, but my mom is Syrian and I was born in Syria. And living through the Lebanese civil war and all the political events that happened, it's very obvious that the Lebanese and the Syrian people don't like each other, they don't get along. It's, it's a very long history. So I was very interested in making a documentary to kind of touch about this story, this subject, but I wanted to tell this political story in a very different way that's not a talking head political documentary. So then in 2008, when I went to Lebanon to visit my parents, I met Musa, um, the Armenian farmer, and he invited me to go have coffee in his migrant worker camp. So I went with his famous red Chevrolet truck, we drove, it was fun, and we went to the camp, and that's when I met Maria. So when I found the two characters, Musa, who's Lebanese Christian landowner, Maria and her family, migrant workers, Syrian Muslim, it was the perfect characters to talk about this tension and set in a beautiful potato fields in a farming. So I, I decided to make the documentary. So in 2009, uh, I had a brand new baby. She was eight weeks old. So I wore her here on my baby Bjorn, carried my baby. I had three-year-old son and a backpack of cameras. And I went to Lebanon to start filming Patata. And it was supposed to be two years uh, documentary to follow the lives of the migrant workers, plant potatoes. And I thought we will be done by the end of 2011. But six months before the film was finished, of course, the Syrian revolution started. And then I thought, you know, I'll follow this another six months. I was sure that it will be over in six months. Everybody thought the revolution would be crushed because Syria had the history of crushing revolutionaries and thought it would be done. No one expected that it was going to turn to civil war and all these issues would happen. So I wasn't prepared to make a 12 year long documentary, 10 years to film, two years to edit. And now we are in year number 13 of going to the festivals. So I wasn't prepared for that, both emotionally, psychologically, logistically, financially, it just happened. And because I was so attached to Maria and the story, the characters, I cared for them and I wanted to see what happens, what happened. And so what happened is in 2020 March, I had to go back to Lebanon to film Maria to continue, but because of the pandemic, the flights got canceled. So I wasn't able to go. And that's when all of us got locked down in our homes. 
And I, I decided, wow, this is the time I have to sit down. And I had 400 plus hours of footage that I sat down, took me two years to edit it to this stage. So the pandemic kind of put an end to the, to the project, otherwise you would have continued. I think so. I think so, because it was, <laughs> it was almost become like an obsession for me. Uh, I wasn't able to stop. And even now, I am in touch with Maria, her family, her brothers, and I know what's going on. I talk to them once a week, and I'm very attached to them. And my husband really hopes that I don't go back with my camera. <laughs> Because my children have had enough of, uh, you know, not having mommy at home for their entire life. Well, now you could also follow Kadia because the, the focus after a while is shifting also to Kadia and, and her young family. And um, as we could read um, uh, after the film, you helped her and her family escape to, to, to uh, uh, go to Toronto, where, she, where they live yeah. now. So you, you could make kind of a part two with them settling down in Toronto. Um, but as far as we are talking to you now, <laughs> you could tell me, how <laughs> are they? And because she seemed to suffer from depression or anorexia or something like really... Um, um, yeah. severe, um, also mental problem. I don't know. You can tell me. Yeah, but. yeah. you're right. You, you're right. Uh, it was a very, very difficult uh, process for me to help them and get them out of there to resettle in Canada. The sponsorship process was exhausting, very difficult. But the most challenging part was for them to resettle in Canada, to get used to the cultural shock, because they had never left their tiny little village in Raqqa in their entire life. So they left from Raqqa, uh, the village of Raqqa, they were outside of Raqqa, with their entire family to Maria's tent camp, the refugee camp, and from there to Canada. So it was really difficult. And um, so I think over the years, they've had enough of having cameras follow them and they just want to start a new life. So that's not an idea that I want to continue with them. They're settled and they're one of the lucky ones who were able to get out of the camp and have a safe life in Canada. But I think my focus right now is, is these refugees that are still stuck in in Lebanon uh, and it's been 10 years and having lived with the refugees on day in day out for so long I know how difficult it is to live in a refugee camp and uh, one month two months we're talking about 10 long years and people are broken now they're exhausted they are hopeless and in Lebanon, only in the Bekaa Valley, where I grew up in that region, there's one million Syrian refugees, just like Maria and her family. And in Lebanon, one and a half million. So they are the ones that really need help. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I promised um, the audience that they can ask yes. questions too. So um, I will repeat them to you. But uh, do you have questions at that point? Do you want to know something? about the people you were following now for over two hours, um, then feel free to ask. Mm -hmm. Um, why, why why was um, Maria never, why did she never marry? Why could she never found, find a man to, to found a family? Was she too strong maybe for, for, for um, a Syrian or also Lebanese man? Was it cultural, cultural problems or? It's a very good question. Um, well, Maria dedicated her entire life for her family. You know, most Muslim women from her village in that culture marry around the age of 16 or 17. But because she was so able to manage uh, the garden, the farming, manage all the workers, they gave her more responsibility. And the family kind of thought of their own benefit to not marry her so she can take care of them. And so... That's what she did year in, year out. She has five brothers and, uh, you know, they're very big tribal family. And so 
lots of relatives. She worked, saved money, and married off one brother. Then she worked, saved money, married off another brother, and they care for their family, and her parents don't work. In their culture, the parents from age of 35, 40, they don't work. The kids take care of them. So basically, she dedicated her entire life to caring for them, everyone. And it got to a point now where, you know, she feels that she's too old to marry a man who comes with a lot of family already because, you know, um, she's not going to marry someone young. It'll be uh, probably a man who's already has a couple of wives. So she doesn't want to do that. And last time I spoke with her, I told her that, you know, things are really exciting in Toronto. People are loving her story. And she was very cute. She said, I hope someone falls in love with me and takes me to Canada. <laughs> so she is dreaming of a new life now. She is the very first time I've ever heard her give up her responsibilities for her family. And she's really at the end of her, her line. Yeah, I guess it was a very conscious de decision to play the Ave Maria um, at this, uh, which, which has uh -huh. a lot of pathos in this moment, but you use big music anyway, but at yeah. this moment, right? So because she's kind of the mother for, for everyone. Yeah, that's right. And I really like, uh, um, I, I really like a lot of music. Um, I usually play with music in my films, but in most of my films, I use a lot of religious Move, uh, music like I have the Azan, the Arabic music, the the Christian um, Orthodox old music that's from the Maronite uh, time when the when the drones are flying over the refugee camp. You hear that music. It's just something I do because for me it represents the problem that we have with our land. It's all about religious hatred and people don't get along. So. I try to layer that kind of music also. And in this way, you know, Ava Maria really worked with her as well. Have they seen the film, Maria and her family in the camps? No, no one in Lebanon has seen the film, including all of them and my family, uh, my family in Lebanon, um, because I haven't been able to go there since uh, the end of 2019, after I filmed the revolution and the end of that year. Um, I've sent them the uh, the trailer, of course, the YouTube, uh, whatever happens, I send it to them. They really like it. Uh, Maria is very happy. She giggles. She's like, oh, I can't believe, you know, she's, she's, sometimes she does things that you don't expect her to, because she's so strong, you don't expect her to do girly things and giggle and, and get shy, which is very, very endearing. Uh, but we, I'm hoping that this year I might be able to go back and uh, do a little screening for the entire refugee camp, gather and invite my mom and my sisters who live there to come and see. Um, that would be very nice. Are there any more questions from the audience's part? In German, I can translate. I have to repeat them anyway. What are you planning to, to do next then, to film next? Um, well, <laughs> I told... No. Go, go. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I told my husband that, who's a producer, he's a very well-known producer in Canada. In fact, that's how we met. Uh, we were in working in film. I told him that I've fallen in love again with another woman whose movie, whose film I want to, whose story I want to bring to the movies and make it a new documentary. He's like, oh, I hope it's not going to be longer than two years. <laughs> Um, the next film that I really want to work on is um, this very, very strong, amazing, charismatic woman that I couldn't take out of my mind after I read her story. She's Canadian and she's long been dead. She died in the 1990s. And uh, it's her story of uh, how she saved the lives of 400 women and children while she was a prisoner of war in Singapore. Um, it's a fascinating story. She suffered from mental illness and she was a strong woman. She stayed behind to help um, all the, the women during, as a Red Cross worker. And uh, I've optioned a book that was written here in Canada. And uh, so that's going to be my next project. I guess I'm very attracted to very strong and uh, powerful women who've done a lot in their lives. 
But you're staying with documentary, not thinking about moving towards fiction. Um, documentary is my first love, but um, I have some plans to move to fiction. I have written a couple of uh, scripts, and one of them, in fact, is based from my own as a real stories that I witnessed in the refugee camp. It's about two uh, girls, uh, two, two teenagers uh, who fall in love in a refugee camp. Um, but this next project that I was telling you about is going to be a mixture of drama and documentary because there will be so much period reenactments to tell the story of the Singapore war. Uh, so it would be a really good experience for me, uh, again, for a second time to do a documentary that's half uh, drama and half uh, documentary, because my previous work was that as well, 23 kilometers. Okay. Thank you, Nora. Good luck with Thank your you. new project and um, stay well. <laughs> Um, thank you for your film. Thank you for being here with us online. Um, thank you, audience. <laughs> yes, I'd like to thank the audience for coming and, and investing two hours to watch Parada. Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>